Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Good morning and welcome to Christ Temple Church. We are located at 3125 West 54th Street here in Los Angeles, and we're glad you're joining us. Uh, we are a christ Center church connecting people to Jesus and to one another, and we hope that our ministry and message today is an encouragement to you to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. To our members, let's remember to give our tithes and offering, and you can do that one of several ways. You can do it through PayPal. You can do it uh, online at ChristTempleLA.org, or you can come here to the church and drop off uh, your, your love gifts. And finally, you can also use your mobile app, Venmo, and the username is Christ Temple LA. Uh, please tell a friend to join us for Sunday School at 930. And remember, our midweek Bible study is Wednesday at 630 p.m. Um, also, please remember to pray for Brother Mark McCool and his family as they mourn the passing of his mother, Sister Martha McCool. Uh, the funeral is Friday, August the 14th at Forest Lawn Hollywood Hills. That's at 6300 Forest Lawn Drive here in Los Angeles, and the zip code is 90068, and the services begin at 1215 p.m. Today our speaker is our pastor, Bishop Lindsay, so grab your Bible, a notebook, and buckle up. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for yet another day. Thank you for your goodness and for your mercy and for your grace. We pray as we pause today, Lord, that you would fill us up, encourage us, inspire us, instruct us, correct us, Lord. We pray that you would watch over us and bless us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning to the Christ Temple Church family and friends who have gathered for the ministry of the Word of God today. I would like to invite your attention to Matthew's Gospel, the very first book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening was came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Truly, you are the Son of God. The storm is passing over. Charles A. Tinley, the beloved black hymn writer and pastor, wrote a hymn called The Storm is Passing Over. This song, when it's sung by some mass choirs, it can thrill and bless your soul with its powerful message of hope and inspiration and faith in God and his mighty power. But what happens in life when the storm doesn't pass over? Instead of, pa instead of passing over, it comes and it sits upon our life and upon our circumstances and situations. During the past week, we've had the storm to come and sit upon America. We have confusion in the White House. We have fires burning out of control in the West. We have COVID-19 everywhere. We have a storm on the march in the East. We have had racial unrest. It's no wonder that our former First Lady Michelle Obama revealed that she's experiencing some low-grade depression. And she, along with many other Americans and people around the world, find themselves overwhelmed and deeply distressed and troubled in their spirit, overwhelmed with the storms and the stresses of our daily life and living mental health issues increasing and abounding everywhere. A good question to ask in times like these is, Lord, why the storm? The Lord tried to warn us through his word that man that is born of a woman is a few days and they are full of trouble. It's always one thing after the other. You are either leaving a storm, headed to a storm, or a storm is around the corner. Let me come to the text this morning in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14. The disciples found themselves in a storm. This is not the first time they were to find themselves in a storm, so they are in a storm again. They had just witnessed earlier in the day our Lord's greatest miracle, greatest in terms of sheer numbers involved, the Lord had fed 5,000 men plus women and children. This is indeed the miracle of all the miracles. All the gospel writers have recorded it and wrote of it, both Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This miracle was more involved because so many people 
were touched by the feeding of the 5,000. Thousands had come that day to hear our Lord teach and minister the word. But as the day grew late, people were tired and hungry. And so Jesus said to his disciples, feed them, give them something to eat. The disciples responded by, what do you mean? How in the world could that be possible? They had searched the crowd and they'd only found the little boy who brought his lunch and he had only five loaves and two fish. But what is that among so many? And Jesus said to those disciples, bring the five loaves and two fishes to me. And he took them, the Bible says, and he break it and blessed it. And the disciples began to pass it out among that great crowd, perhaps a crowd of 15 or 20,000 people all together when you count the women and the children, reminding us once again that little is much if God is in it. And somehow through the miraculous power and hand of Almighty God, that those five loaves and two fishes fed the 5,000 men plus the women and children, and there were 12 baskets of leftovers. The crowd is so amazed at the miracle that they have witnessed and just experienced that they are ready to take Jesus and make him king. He's the one they've been looking for, someone who can satisfy their appetites and someone who can lead them out from under the oppression of the Roman government. Jesus is indeed the man for the hour. So they are ready to come by force and take him and make him the king. But Jesus, knowing that his hour is not yet come, he tells his disciples, go and get into the boat and go to the other side of the lake. And he would take the responsibility for sending the crowd away. So they went and got into the boat about to cross the Sea of Galilee while our Lord is busy sending the crowds, dispersing the people, sending them back to their homes and villages. And after he sends them away, the Bible reveals that he goes up on the mountainside. He's alone now and he begins to engage in prayer with the Father God. I wonder if we could learn that lesson or be reminded of it again this morning that here he is, the son, the very son of the living God. And yet even though he is God in the flesh, but he also knows the value of spending time in prayer, getting on his face before the Father God. He sets time aside where he withdraws from the crowd and he steps away from his disciples. He finds that solitary place and there, in the solitude, he goes before the Father God. If Jesus needed time alone, time to pray, time to recharge and to renew his batteries, time to commune with the Father, how much more do you and I need to find that quiet place, that secret closet where we can talk with the Father God? That place where we can pull aside, step away from the cares and the busyness of this life and just spend time with God the Father in prayer. This is why our Lord said men ought always to pray and not to faint. Perhaps the reason that we get so weary and tired along the way is because we spend so little time in prayer. We spend so little time with the Father recharging our spiritual batteries, being renewed in a way that we can only be, re be renewed as we pray and seek the face of Almighty God. Well, as our Lord is away on that mountainside alone, the disciples are down below. They're out there now on the Sea of Galilee, and they have been rowing, trying to make it to the other side, but suddenly a storm has come up. And 
Even though they have been out there for hours, they are rowing into some very strong headwinds. The seas have become rough. The night has encroached upon them and they find themselves in the darkness. And so there in the face of the wind and the rain and the storm, the disciples are being beat down as it were. They are tired and frustrated and frightened. These disciples were on the edge because they were in a storm that they could not control. And right now we are in a storm that is beyond our ability to control. This storm of corona, the coronavirus and COVID-19, it's beyond our ability to control. We do not see our way through. We wonder when and if ever things will return to some degree of normalcy. Well, as they are about to panic, suddenly, they look up and they see someone walking on the sea. And these men, these disciples, they are terrified and they scream out in fear because they thought they were seeing a ghost. And then Jesus speaks to them words that we all need to hear during this particular season, word that bring, words that bring comfort to our soul. Don't be afraid. Oh, certainly fear is everywhere. Right now, we are in a fearful season. Will I get sick? Will this president retain the office of leadership? What will I do about employment? Will there be a vaccine? When are things going to get back to the way they were? How will we make it financially? When will the church open back up? When can I receive family and friends? Fear is everywhere. And yet in the midst of their fear, Jesus says, fear not. The Bible is filled with verses that speak to the human condition. And over and over again, one of the words that falls frequently from the words of our lips is fear not. I am told that if we search our Bible thoroughly, we will find 365 fear nots. A fear not for every single day of the year because that's so often where we live. That's so often where we park. We park in the land of fear. So much of life is out of our control. We feel so helpless and so hopeless at times. It's good to be reminded of what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 43. Our God speaking through his servant, the prophet, Fear not, I have redeemed thee. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, it shall not burn you, and the flames will not consume you. Over and over again, the message in the Holy Scriptures is don't be afraid, because our God says, fear not. He does indeed have it under control. It may be over our head, but it is under his feet. And Jesus tells his disciples, don't be afraid because he is the great I am who is with them. In the midst of the storm, in the midst of their panic, in the midst of their confusion, in the midst of their fear, he is with them, and our God is always larger than our circumstances, and he is indeed in charge. That name he gives to his disciples, he says, I am. That's the name God gave to Moses when Moses wanted to know whom should he say to Pharaoh that he was, that God was. And he said, just tell them that I am that I am. God spoke to Moses and said, tell them, I am that I am. Our God is not was or shall be. He always is. He is always a 
present help, a right now help in our times and seasons of trouble. He's always what he needs to be. Whatever is needed, he is there for his people. The old preacher said that if you need a lawyer, he'll be a lawyer. If you need a doctor, he is the great physician. If you need a bridge over troubled waters, our Lord is that bridge. If you need a friend like none other, our Lord will be that friend. If you need a banker or a financier, our Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. <clears throat> be of good cheer. What do you need? Our God is able in the midst of the storm. He's still able to make a way out of no way. Peter, after hearing the voice of our Lord who says, I am that I am. Peter gets all excited as Peter frequently does. And he says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. Even though Jesus was walking on the water, Peter is ready to step out onto the sea. Peter was willing to get out of the boat. And many times that is our challenge. We're unwilling to get out of the boat. We just want the same old, same old. We get so satisfied, complacent, and stale. But our God is always able to do a new thing if we're only willing to get out of the boat and trust him. <clears throat> to get out of the boat of the familiar, the ordinary, step on the waves of uncertainty and see what God will do. Peter found himself walking on the water. And as long as his focus was on Jesus, he was able to walk on the boisterous waves of the sea. He experienced the power of God in a brand new way a new revelation of who this God in Jesus truly was and truly is. As his eyes were focused on Jesus, he walked on the ways. But in the moment that his eyes left the master and he began to look at the waves, he began to head down into the depths of the sea. But even then when he cried out, Lord, save me, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to Peter, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Or Peter, why did you take your eyes off of me? Little faith, because he took his eyes off of the master. Suppose we changed our focus today. Instead of focusing on our storm, or focusing on circumstances and situations that are beyond our control, what would happen if we kept our gaze upon the master and only glanced at our circumstances? We would realize that our Lord Jesus Christ is greater than all of our circumstances. I find myself praying now, Lord, be glorified. Even in the midst of the coronavirus, somehow, some way, use this to your glory, Father. Because in all things, our God is the master. And when they got back into the boat, the Bible says there was not only peace immediately on the sea, but they were also immediately at the other side. The disciples, when they witnessed this miracle, the peace, and their immediacy of going to the other side, they realized that this man, Jesus, he is indeed God of very gods because he has the sea and all circumstances under his control. In my trials, in the storms of life, I'm able to see my God and meet him in a fresh and a new way without a test I will never have a testimony. Oh, to go back to Charles A. Tinley, that great poet and hymn, and hymn writer. He has written that great hymn of the church that our parents sang so heartily. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. 
when this world is tossing like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. In these days when life is tossing us up and down and back and forth, I am grateful to bring the report that our Lord is willing to come walking on the waters and he is willing to stand by us through the storm. He is the one that makes the difference in the midst of the storm because he can speak peace to the storm. He can be that great I am, whatever we need him to be, the God who is indeed the way maker, the God who gives us a testimony on the other side of the test where we're reminded that our God is able. He's a God who makes all things work together for good to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. He's a God who's able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we can ask or even think. We're in the season of the storm, but God is a great God and God can walk upon the stormy waters of our life and of our nation. Our God is able. Our God is equal to this hour. Will we trust him? Because he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. I challenge you today to trust him, to come to him, to follow him, to serve him, to enter into a personal relationship with him. I would invite you this morning, if you know not Christ as your Savior, if you have not repented of your sin, I would invite you this morning to come to Jesus, to trust him with your life, to know that he's able to forgive your sin. He's able to write your name down in the Lamb's book of life and give you the assurance of help in this life and hope in the world to come. Will you experience him today by believing on him, by trusting him to forgive you of your sins and to give you that gift most precious, the gift of life eternal? In Jesus' name, I commend this Savior to you. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, again, we thank you for your grace, mercy, and love toward us. We are so grateful that you are willing to walk with us through the storm. And our prayer today, that those who are hearing, if they have not trusted you, they may come to you in faith this day and believe on you to be Savior and Lord of their life. And, O oh God, as we all walk through this present storm, we're so grateful that you're able to walk on the waters. You're able, O oh God, to bring us a peace that the world cannot give and that the world cannot take away. We trust you now. We bless your name. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.